Hello, welcome to another episode of Color Analysis. Last time we discussed how important values and how much information can be extracted from an image just by looking at it from a black and white perspective. We focused on analyzing the lower and upper parts of an image, which we called blacks and whites. We went through many possible traps uh, you can fall into in those areas. Today, we will switch it up and focus only on hues. This will be another aspect you can investigate if the colors are on the right track. We are going to introduce one really trivial concept that will train your eye in the right way. One which will help you to focus on those colors that truly matter. And what matter is the greenery and the sky. That's as much and as little. We're about to tell you why and, uh, as usual, I take a deep dive into the color perception. So let's get at it. Okay, generally there's a phenomenon that shows we are uh, sharing an understanding of certain colors with other people. You, me and millions of other people are more sensitive to certain colors than others. And these colors are deeply ingrained in us. See, if I tell you to imagine what a clear and beautiful blue sky looks like, you can immediately bring it to your mind. If I tell you to recall a red brick or dry sand in the desert, you will also have a certain shade in your head. But if I tell you to recall the color of wood, well, you'll definitely have something in your mind, but whether it's going to be light or dark, orange or red, I will never know, unless you tell me. We won't necessarily be talking about the same thing. So going back, we have certain colors in our mind that we think of similarly. Uh, there are a couple of these colors, but today we will focus on two of the three most important ones that exist. For our purposes, as we said, it will be green and sky. This is what we will focus on, and from now uh, we will call them memory colors. Memory colors or the effect of memory colors. There is another very important memory color, and that is the skin color. Greenery sky and the skin form the trio that you need to pay the most attention to if you work with color. In our course, we do not focus on people, so we will not be analyzing skin. However, the principles we will start talking about uh, in a moment, we will also apply to the skin. You can keep this in the back of your head um, just to train your eye. So, whatever the memory color is, it has to be very well adjusted. The greater the deviation from such a natural color, the more we will repel our viewers. They will subconsciously feel that something is wrong, because they care about these colors and they understand them the most. Some colors are more important than others. That's just the way it is. And from now on, we will pay special attention to them, especially as greenery and sky will actually be visible in 70-80% of your commercial work, it's worth having this mental benchmark in your head of what those colors should look like. What is more, what they should look like during the day, dusk, nighttime scenario, etc. So how do you do it? Of course, references will help. We don't want to trust ourselves again. We want to soak up as much as possible from references. We want to pick the mind and the work of our other artists, our other stars. Therefore, let's see what those hues are supposed to look like just to get in a good frame of mind. We have the works of different studios and artists here, our star guests. As we look at the daytime scenery, it all seems so fresh to us, so attractive, such that we want to look at it. We buy into it immediately. Nothing throws us off balance. It really looks believable. The colors of both sky and greenery look natural. If these hues weren't so finely meshed, if they weren't so fresh, we would be immediately unsettled by something. These memory colors have to be what they have to be. And let's delve a little deeper into this. We have taken pieces of those images and put them together in a form of a collage. We prepare them to analyze those memory colors in greater detail. And now, 
we have different shades of greenery. Some are sort of more yellowish, some are bluish, but we have a certain spectrum of hues between green yellows all the way up to these green blue colors. And the same with the sky. Some skies can be darker and some can be brighter, but we can see that those hues are somewhere in there between green and basically cyan, like here, all the way up to blue and maybe even some kind of magenta. Again, a spectrum between green and violet. So let's keep the mind the word spectrum in our minds and check how it's reflected on a scope. Let's see how it all looks in Resolve. And now this is DaVinci Resolve Studio software. Don't worry if this is your first time seeing it. We won't need it for absolutely anything except to explain this color theory. It has some options to demonstrate what colors look like. And that's all we need. We're going to take the color apart. And if you want to do it yourself, you can download Resolve for free. It will have some limitations, but you can look that up either way. So let me illustrate the colors of the sky in a very specific way. And this mosaic, which we just saw a second ago, we can see on the chart here. See, there is a definite preference for certain hues. The more spikes, the more this exact hue occurs in this collage, kind of similar to a histogram. Now, that doesn't mean that the colors can go somewhere further, but statistically, the day is selected somewhere here. These colors seem to appeal to many different graphic designers. We can see it on the scope as well. This is such a very specific chart. You can see that we have RGB values here, R, G, B, and here on the opposite side, we have C, M, Y, cyan, magenta, and yellow. It's a basic color wheel. Well, we have cyan here and we have this blue, cyan and blue. Then we see that those colors are distributed exactly perfectly between them. This is a statistical selection of this color. Those memory colors are somewhere in here and it is shared between different artists. Those colors just sell. We can also see it with green. Greenery is also a memory color, you know, but we can see that those greens uh, also have a certain spike here, which is a particular yellow hue right on the nose. We can see that those more orangey greens are a little bit worse and the more bluish they are the same way. There are just very few of these bluish greens that look cool. We usually try to aim somewhere here, even though we have a bit more freedom. We can see here, again, going back, we have different sky gradients here. There are different hues here, but when we look at them, we should have this ability to immediately notice if any of them are somehow grossly twisted the wrong way. And if you see it for yourself, this shade of green, for example, makes me really spit feathers. When I look at this, uh, I think this is far too green. It's a shade somewhere in here. For example, this might fit and this might as well, but it's already quite magenta. I have this mental benchmark somewhere in my head just to see what these colors should look like. Yes, um, there's a definite preference in the choice of shades of green and the sky. Over time, as you start to pay attention to them, you encode into your eye or memory what range of hue is the one that sells. And this is generally how we want to perceive our memory colors. We will be looking for that color that is somehow statistically repeated and that commercially works out. The more images we look at, the better we will be able to pick up that hue. We will get into the technical approach to both plant materials and the sky in the next lessons. In the very next lesson, we'll learn how to make and adjust greenery shaders. And in one that follows, we learned how to manage sky colors. Don't worry, we'll show you how to apply the concept of memory colors in Corona and 3ds Max. Nevertheless, now we still need to cover this topic a little bit more to say when these colors can go wrong just like we did before with the values. 
there are a lot of different traps when you lose control, when something starts to look wrong, and often you may not even know it. Sometimes uh, people choose greenery and sky colors spectacularly wrong, and it looks absolutely bad. Often those colors are so twisted that it's really hard to look at them. And if you're self-thought, and uh, most of us are, you're not to blame. No one has said to me in, in plain language like, look at these colors of the sky and green, they are the most important. And there's a way, uh, you know, you can adjust them. So yeah, let's move on to what's the biggest obstacle to choosing the right hues, especially the memory colors. This is the heart of this lesson. If, even if we don't uh, do something perfectly, it's important to be on your guard when we deviate from those natural colors too much. And this happens to literally everyone. And there are several reasons for this. We will tell you about four that we hope will open you up uh, to perceiving colors and working with colors differently. So first things first. The first argument as to why these colors are wrong is generally how you perceive colors or how you see colors. There may be situation where your mental benchmark in your eye is ordering you to make the sky green or to make the greenery blue. Being a graphic designer is such a continuous journey. And if you feel that your color grading is not working out for you, then you need to start with yourself. Here earlier, uh, we talked about values, but today hues are added to the mixture. You can ask other artists about your work if the greenery and the sky colors seem natural and if not could you adjust them as you think they should be uh, before you trust yourself with colors be sure uh, you have a good reason for doing so that's why we generally work with references we also ask other people do these colors look okay or wrong uh, because we don't want to fully trust ourselves how you perceive these colors is arguably the biggest reason something goes wrong. Your hands are the driving force to your eye, but there's a little caveat here. What you're looking at has to be in line with reality. We're talking about your monitor here, which ideally should be a good quality calibrated monitor. Because having a poorly calibrated monitor is literally trying to fish for gold with a sieve riddled with holes. If you can't trust your gear, how do you know that you're looking at something that is actually correct? You have to trust that uh, what you're looking at really isn't misleading you. All uh, the more so at the very beginning of your career. When you don't have such a well-trained eye, and some people say, you know, well, why should I have a well-calibrated monitor? Uh, why should I even invest in a better monitor? If my viewer is watching it on a, you know, like shitty display, uh, some crappy receiver. But imagine a situation like this. If your render after color correction comes out with an error and your viewer looks at your work under even worse conditions, those errors will multiply. They will be even worse. If your sky is a little bit green, your viewer will see an even more saturated green sky. And the truth is, you're not going to change what someone views your work on, but you're trying to release an image that is as close to real world conditions as possible, just as reliable as possible. It's very important to trust and invest in a monitor or calibrate it properly. Often it can be a very trivial reason why your works don't look cool. It could just be the monitor you're going to be stagnant uh, just because you've got some monitor that's got twisted like white balance or I don't know, some vignetting or something like that. And you can also, and we always do this, look at a different piece of work on a different monitor. You can ask others to tell if they are really seeing it all right. One cool trick is to use the iPad. It's easier to spot if the colors are too saturated or shifted since mobile and tablet displays usually have a wider color gamut than a regular desktop monitors. I practically always use the iPad if I'm exporting something. I upload it to Google Drive and sometimes I just look at um, the areas that are bright, dark, and I sometimes might catch something, focus on the greenery, focus on the sky and adjust them so ever so slightly, you know? 
Okay then, so the first reason why we don't match colors perfectly, especially memory colors, is us or our monitor. But let's assume we have a good monitor and we are open to change. Where to look for the next places where we can proverbially shoot ourselves in the foot. And such a place where we fail with memory colors is when we do color correction, especially the one for the whole image at once global operations on color. We think we are correcting one thing and the other thing is totally falling apart. We want to change the temperature of the highlights or the sky, green, anything. And all of a sudden, everything really starts to fall apart when you are playing with Corona frame buffer too much. And again, in the next lessons, we'll learn how to make things nice and simple. But right now, just Pay attention to how global operations can mess up color. Twist the blues towards green, twist the greens towards some kind of yellow, and we can see that when we change the white balance. It changes everything in our picture, and we might think that the sky looks more interesting, but suddenly our greens start to look too artificial already, too orange. This is a huge trap to fall into here and I won't even talk about tints. If we change the tint, suddenly some strange colors start to appear. Here we have this blue-green ones and they don't look anything like the memory colors. Neither green nor sky. Even such subtle changes can introduce very artificial shades that don't resemble the memory colors at all. In fact, those tints can appear out of the sudden you don't necessarily need to change the green magenta tint to have the image tinted in some way. If you use a low quality HDRI for illumination, you can have those tints as well. Sometimes it can be barely noticeable and sometimes it can be very intense. But we will get into that in lesson number 8. So, moving on. Or perhaps one small fact though. Back in the days, uh, we did a small test comparing different sky models in Corona. And as you imagine, choosing between an HDRI or various sky models also impacts the hue of the memory colors, the sky in particular. Also, you can see how the neutral snow colors react, especially in the shaded areas. There's all the tints possible, starting from cyan to almost magenta. You can see they have different saturation levels as well, which also adds to the perception of the memory colors. Whenever you choose any of those options, keep an eye on the sky and greenery colors. They can easily shift away from nice and natural hues of memory colors. Okay, another place we can lose these memory colors where they become slightly twisted is also the use of tone mapping. We went through it in the previous lesson about values, ACES and filmic. It's the way we transition from a wider spectrum of colors to a more manageable one. We don't want to repeat it here and we'll tell you how to manage it in two lessons. Nevertheless, you may keep it in the back of your head that you can mess with memory colors whenever you decide to choose ACES or filmic highlights. And the last aspect that can chase you away from those natural memory colors here in the frame buffer is the use of LUTs. A lot of people love to use them. In general, in the last lesson, in the last color analysis, we're going to talk about working with LUTs. It's going to be a little bit of a demystifying thing because LUTs are cool. LUTs are quick inspiration, shot of inspiration, but often when applying them, the colors get out of control and they start to mess up. Greens go somewhere into blues, some yellows. We often lose detail as well. And what we really want is 100% control over what we are doing. We are not going to go into it too much at this stage. But as you can guess, those lots are operations that are literally supposed to change our memory colors. We can see how they change here. We see them changing different temperatures and different shades. Everything is from green all the way up to magenta. And we are already losing that natural look. 
it's out of our control. So if we want to train our own eye and do it consciously, for the time being, we are not going to use LUTs. We want to adjust those colors from scratch so that we have 100% control. So once again, I remind you that how you do this will be told in the next lesson. And now we are just focusing on what can go wrong. If you have been doing any of these operations, chances are that this is where the problem could be. Why those colors don't look as good as they could. Okay, our deliberations end uh, when it comes to the frame buffer, but we have a few other places uh, where you can consider whether you are making a mistake. Another thing is uh, such a fun fact. There's this interesting correlation in working with color that when you've been sitting on something for a, such a long time and the, suddenly the colors somehow get out of hand in small steps, like, you know, I, I, you work on something for three to five days, you often come back to the project after a few months and do some tweaks, little uh, like operations here and there. Um, you're changing exposure, you're changing the saturation. If you, if you were to compare what your colors look like in your first image and your last work, you might find out that the memory colors, uh, you know, are a little bit skewed. And uh, interestingly enough, you don't even have to change the hue in your work. You don't have to change, you know, the shade for it to change on its own. Let's check one example here. If we change the brightness, which we have downwards here, and we change the saturation by the very property of colors, as we increase the brightness and saturation, we have colors from magenta all the way up to greens. So basically the whole spectrum of memory colors. And what we really want is that them to be somewhere in the middle. And by just working on the image, we have one hue that we started to make brighter and more saturated, and we didn't change anything with the hue. We just changed that brightness and suddenly, boom, one color becomes another. That's why, by the way, when we had our first lesson on color analysis, we started by landing those tonal ranges from white and black so that we don't have to change the brightness level anymore, so that we don't have the situation where we lose control through small changes. And let me illustrate it with even more tangible example. We have a situation that happens to many artists and they don't even notice. And that situation is to replace the sky properly. Let's look at this example. We have a render in a day scenario, which you know, looks okay, but I think it should definitely benefit from sky replacement. So we selected an image, uh, a nice one, and we are now faced with the issue of adjusting it to match our render. And in 90% of the cases, the image will be darker than what you had in the render initially. So obviously, you're having the issues around trees. Over here. By the way, we will talk about the sky replacement and dealing with the fringe later on. So don't worry about that. What we want to show is the problem of memory colors. And at this moment, we would naturally increase the brightness of this image. So let's add a curve adjustment and raise it. And what can we observe now? Well, we had a natural sky memory color before, and now it's shifted toward blue-green. It literally just changed. When you change the brightness, you shift the hues along the way. That's how colors work. And if you're not careful about it, it's a quick recipe to ruin the memory colors in your image. So a quick tip is to use a hue and saturation adjustment and shift the color toward magenta back. We can also decrease the saturation because it gets more vivid while increasing the brightness as well. We can save this situation but you need to be aware of it in the first place. Okay, now let's go back to Resolve again for a moment. It's going to be a bit of a fun fact now, but you'll see how colors can go wrong, how memory colors can go wrong through bad lighting choices. 
that's exactly what we'll focus on in two lessons with HDRIs. Let's just focus on those memory colors. We have rendered several different images with various HDRIs here. There's no color correction, just raw rendering. We haven't changed anything in the frame buffer, but as you can guess, the sky colors and the green colors are totally different. We can also notice how our scopes reflect it. The sky colors should be somewhere here in the middle, and the green colors should be somewhere in the middle here. And they are going crazy around the scopes in every direction here. You can see that the memory colors are really doing such a micro disco here. If you choose between many different HDRIs, you might end up with such a different illumination and colors overall. It's drastically changing everything. Those are the spectacular errors we were talking about. Green skies and blue greens. Again, in the next practical lesson, we are going to talk about how to work with color, how to work with HDRIs, when they look good and when they look bad, how to make it better, so don't worry about it. Okay, uh, that would be generally as much as we would like to convey in this lesson. Circling back. Some colors are important and more important. And the king of colors hues, the most important one of them is the sky and the green. Yes, we want to train our eyes to understand when they are okay. And above all, we want to know all the ways we lose control and when they go wrong. Here we have a certain spectrum in which we can operate. And we want to know it by heart. We want to know uh, and be able to adjust these colors of green so they are fresh, so they so the sky feel uh, like vivid. Let's try to focus on that as we look and scroll through Instagram, whether those colors are really popping. Um, and we hope this encourages you um, to look at colors differently. When scrolling, literally look at the green and blue and you'll see a difference. And this is really where we could end this lesson. We have a few more words to add. If you are still unsatisfied, we have a section when we reveal a little bit of nuance regarding the sky and the green. This might be knowledge for more advanced artists whose brains are not yet steaming, you know. Who would have thought that you could carry on so long about those leaves and skies? It's the final stretch, but it's going to be a bit more intense. And getting back to the sky first. We know that statistically the sky is chosen somewhere between cyan and blue. It's such a universal sky color. But will it always look natural and believable? Could there be a situation where a slightly greenish sky turns out to be a better choice? The answer is yes. Memory colors are a spectrum and even small changes can affect the viewer's perception of it to be more natural or less so. And if we want to make a more believable shade of the sky, we need to delve more into the geographical location and the cultural aspect of our work. You can treat this a little bit as a fan fact. If you are just starting out as an artist, try to focus on what we have been saying so far. Try to nail down that nice shade of commercial blue that you've seen here on the board. Before you start shifting it a little bit, First, do that kind of mental benchmarking in your head, in your mind's eye. But if you're looking for something more, if you're looking for this kind of expertise, we hope this will give you what we are about to say, some food for thought. Uh, these are not rules carved in stone, so you can always use inspiration, of course, respond to what your client says, but no less. The colors of the sky depend on where you are in the world. Sometimes a client who lives in a project location far away from us says that the sky is a little bit different in their place and we are likely to be a little bit confused. And what do you mean? Uh, does the sky look different in different places? And, you know, of course it does. A different hue of sky will be in London, a different one in Greece, and a different one in tropics, different one in desert. There are also differences between the shade of the sky in the city, a big city, and a clearing in a forest or a location high in the mountains. Even small changes can determine whether something looks more believable or not. And here, 
we can distinguish between three factors that affect the color of the sky. The first would be where you are, or more precisely, where the sun is in the sky. It is essential to realize that the sky will vary drastically, not only in terms of hue, but also in brightness and saturation. We can see another work here. The higher we are above sea level, the more saturated and deep this shade of sky will be, often going into deep navy blue. This can be seen when you are on a plane flying 10 kilometers above sea level. At lower altitudes, the sky tends to be a little bit less saturated and a little brighter. And here we have a relatively broad spectrum, but more on that in a moment. In addition, the sky color depends on the angle of the sun and the angle of the sun is influenced by the time of the day and the latitude. Having that in mind, the sky is the bluest when the sun is directly overhead at the zenith, and it's getting brighter and desaturated as the sun goes down. And you know, since the sun doesn't get high overhead near the poles, so it will never be as blue as near the equator. Another aspect, and Quite an important one is that what is in the atmosphere, especially close to the horizon. If we are away from the city on a beautiful cloudless day, we can expect that universal blue color. It may be slightly deeper and it may be more saturated, but the deviation in hue will be minimal. Whereas, you know, in the world, there are all sorts of filth in the air, dust, salt, fumes and pollution. If there is high humidity in the air, in places like South or Southeast Asia, then we can expect a brighter and more desaturated sky. If there is a lot of exhaust fumes and smoke, often in big cities, the sky can be a little bit greenish. In the desert, there is going to be a sky that's orange from the sand in the air. If we have a client from Dubai, with some crazy projects in the desert, we might be tempted to have a slightly orange sky by the first round, or at least at the horizon. It all has to be done with taste, of course, but references can help you with that too. The final argument will be the cultural aspect of the sky. It's an argument of the kind of, because I liked it that way. And uh, surprisingly enough, there is truth to a large extent to this argument. It may sound ridiculous, but we have to be careful of the cultural, or rather pop culture, aspect of our audience. Each of us is fed by some aesthetics that break uh, through masses in our society, in film or in television. Local conditions and the background of the viewer affect the perception of the sky. You can even look at those six different blue colors, which you can find under the name sky blue in different countries you can immediately notice that they vary in hue and it has nothing to do with the actual sky. For example, the Mediterranean sky is associated with a deeper shade of blue, more shifted towards magenta, while in Japan, the sky is on the greener side and much more desaturated. When you watch an anime, you can notice the sky is paler or greener than what feels natural for you if you come from the Western culture. Kind of interesting. And again, that doesn't mean the sky is actually green or magenta in those regions, but there's an argument to be made to go with a different hue or at least take it into consideration if your client comes from different culture. Sky colors can be considered on many levels. We encourage you to investigate different hues and make a reinforced decision about them. Although your client may not understand 100%, there's a chance uh, they will feel it uh, when the sky seems more familiar, especially on the international uh, level. You can Google pictures and read what the climate is like there and adjust accordingly. In Australia, like this. In cities, like this. Like in the Mediterranean, like uh, something different. You can do a quick research and think about how this hue should be met and certainly not make any huge mistakes in it. Okay, that's about it uh, when it comes to the colors of the sky. Moving on, uh, we can add a couple of words about the greenery. 
And as we said, greenery colors give much more room for maneuver. It's still a memory color, but gives a little bit more wiggle room for selection of the hues. Now, uh, when preparing for this lesson, we had a hard time finding very concrete knowledge about the shades of green. From one source, uh, we learned that the darker greens make greens appear a little bit healthier, but it's hard to see uh, this like a rule carved in stone. From another source, uh, we learned that young leaves uh, go more uh, towards yellow and all leaves uh, towards blue. And still, it's hard to take that as something that realistically follow when working on a project. Maybe it's some fun fact or maybe it's something useful. That's why we share it. But it's, you know, it, each plant may just look differently. Nevertheless, we will look at plants from a broader perspective. The very next lesson is called Good Enough Greens. We will be looking at greens and creating materials not only in terms of memory colors, but also what translucency they have and what reflections they have. This is all coming up. But what we can say about greens is not necessarily to get as close to the perfect green, but above all, not to do it wrong, to, to invest in it in the first place and foremost. This is a common element in many of the projects you see online. That the green is somehow so rotten, almost brown, or totally bright, saturated, almost neon. Even though we have a relatively broad spectrum of acceptable greens, still the colors are often wrong. How does one deal with all of this? We will tell you in the next lesson. Lots of cool stuff that applies to commercial work. Okay, we have successfully completed another lesson of color analysis. You know, uh, you have two techniques to control and train your eye. Before it was the values and now it's the hues. We have certain areas of the image to investigate. You can check whites and blacks, which have their own rules. And in the same way, we have certain hues that we try to adjust as best as we can. We treat the greenery in the spectrum, so they are neither too yellow or too blue. We think about the sky, so it's neither green or magenta. We focus on the greenery, we focus on the sky, and as we said, that's as much and as little. With further color analysis, we will go deeper with your color perception of both values and hues, and this is just the beginning. Hope you had a good time and see you in the next lesson.